the Dean of Arts. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this event. Can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we stand, the Wurundjeri people, and pay our respects to their elders, past and present, um, and welcome our two guests, obviously, Malcolm Fraser and Margaret Simons, well known uh, to all of you, I know. Uh, we're looking forward to an interesting um, conversation and, uh, and some interaction, I hope, um, around the contents of what has proved to be uh, a popular um, and captivating <coughs> volume. Um, and obviously uh, a captivating uh, life in Malcolm's case. As a political scientist, a particular um, uh, pleasure for me to, um, to, to have Malcolm here. We, we have in earlier times had him give uh, lectures in the program and he has uh, been generous with his time to the university, so uh, it's a particular pleasure for us um, to have him here. And I'd like to acknowledge also the staff um, in the faculty and in the School of Historical Studies who um, uh, initiated and put this um, evening together for us. Now they have a, a well worked um, routine I'm told that doesn't involve my active participation at least at this stage so uh, while I turn over to them would you please make them very welcome. Well, Malcolm, one thing I think we've learnt by um, talking together is that people like to know how we wrote this book. And so I thought you could talk about that and I'll correct you if you go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, Melbourne University Press and some people have been wanting me to write a book uh, for quite some time. I hadn't wanted to because I knew to do it properly would involve an enormous amount of work and I wasn't prepared to do that. And secondly, I thought a lot of contemporary histories are out there to, um, you know, for self-justification, I'm right and the other fellow was wrong. And I was totally uninterested in that sort of a book. Anyway, um, I said to Louise Adler at one point, well, if you can find somebody who'll do all the work and somebody who can write, um, then, uh, you know, maybe I'll consider it. And Margaret um, appeared. She thought she was interviewing me to see whether she would or would not do the book. I thought I was interviewing her. <laughs> um, I must say I was, you know, after we both decided, all right, we'd give it a go, um, I was nervous for quite a while I, because words didn't appear on paper. And then a couple of draft chapters arrived and I read them and I thought, well, that seems readable, but I wasn't sure that I was any sort of a judge. I gave them to Tammy to look at and I thought she'd read a page and a half and said, you know, I'll, I'll go through the rest of that later when I've got more time. But she actually read through to the end and said, well, that's very readable. She was interested. So I, from that moment on, I began to relax. So I thought, <laughs> all right, we can have a book. Mm. A bit later on, Tammy accused me of writing like Barbara Cartland. <laughs> well, that was only in describing her. Yes, exactly. I have to say that my struggles with what went in and what came out were, were much tougher with Tammy than with you. <laughs> well, I've always been easy to get on with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Malcolm, turning to more serious matters, um, what is a liberal? Uh, somebody who has respect for other people, no matter who or what that other person is, uh, somebody who, who believes uh, in a, a fair go, somebody who uh, wants to maximise freedom for individual people, so long as that freedom doesn't trample on the rights and freedoms of other people in society, uh, a government that will not seek to maximise actions, but will seek to maximise opportunity for individuals to uh, follow their own path, but also a government that recognises that there are some things which governments just have to do, which individuals can't do for themselves, um, to establish a fair marketplace, to hold the ring, to see that the world is fair and that people are treated justly, that the rule of law, due process are followed. Um, sometimes I think in more recent times, uh, when people have said, you know, market deregulation, self-regulation, self uh, uh, corporations can do anything, banks can do anything, they won't ever be irresponsible. 
Uh, well, it was that attitude that led to the crash of a, a year or so ago. Not so much in Australia, where I think we behaved more sensibly, but certainly in a number of European countries, in Britain and the United States. So while a liberal will want to maximize freedom for individuals, there are obviously limits to that freedom, because you start to jeopardize the future of all of us. Uh, but a government, above all, that respects the rule of law, and that's something we haven't had in recent times. Mm. So where do we find the Liberals today in politics? Um, well, I don't know many. <laughs> Petro Giorgio is a Liberal. There were a few people who worked for him on, on uh, um, asylum seekers and children in detention, um, you know, which, which is a classic example of what a Liberal ought not to do, indeed what any politician ought not to do. Um, but the Labour Party um, didn't seem to mind all that much. It's, it's supported the Howard government in totally illiberal anti-terrorist legislation, which could result in any one of you being arrested as you leave this hall. Um, and you won't know why you've been arrested, I mean, at some point. And you can't tell anyone, you just disappear. That's not fantasy, it's in the law. And they only have to believe that you have observed something that um, might help them in their anti-terrorist inquiries. They don't have to believe you're guilty of anything. They know you're innocent. But they still have the power to detain you secretly. And if you talk about it afterwards, you can go to jail for five years. If a journalist writes about it, that journalist can go to jail for five years. Um, I think such laws really promote the cause of terrorism. I don't think they help in the fight against terrorism. But Labour and Liberal parties supported that sort of law. That's not a Liberal law. In my book, anyone who voted for it is not a Liberal. Well, that includes a large category of people, doesn't it? it oh, it does. Well, it includes the Labour Party and the Liberal Party in the Federal Parliament, or in the last Parliament. So was Malcolm Turnbull a Liberal? Is Malcolm Turnbull a Liberal? I think he's a Liberal, yes. I think his attitude about people... I'm not sure when he was leader that he was able to define this adequately. I think he should have. Um, one of the reasons why I think he was beaten, it was really the most terrible process, because forget about whether you believe in emissions trading or don't. He won the vote uh, in the Liberal Party. There was a block of National Party in the room voting against it. So there had to be a very substantial majority of Liberals in favour of it. But the people who were against Malcolm Turnbull said, well, that's not good enough, so then they had a spill motion. Then he won that. They said, look, we've got to get rid of this guy. I almost think they said, we've got to get rid of this guy because he's a liberal. <laughs> um, and they walked out. And the liberals turned tail and ran. They didn't fight. Um, and somehow the people who adopted these tactics um, um, got charged of the federal party. And so is Tony Abbott a liberal? Well, he's uh, the leader of the Liberal Party. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Should I just leave a silence after that? Or? Well, if you like. Um, I, I think he's probably enormous. Look, he, he is proud of the word conservative. He describes the party as conservative. People, you know, want to pick up Ming's mantle and think that they're under his umbrella. But Menzies quite deliberately rejected the, the, the you know, he was f founding a new party. Because he had a great love of many things British, he might have thought, well, right, a Conservative Party in England, call the party here a Conservative Party. It had been called all sorts of things in the previous 40, 50 years. But no, that wasn't good enough for him. He would have regard if he was called a Conservative, he would have taken that as an insult, as indeed I would have. He wanted a liberal party, which was liberal in philosophic terms, forward-looking, progressive, willing to make experiments, willing to create opportunity. Now, um, the Liberal Party is very good at denigrating people who should be its heroes. And the, um, Billy McMahon, Billy Snedden, John Gordon, all made statements, said things, did things, which tended to disassociate themselves from the Menzies' legacy. So I'm not like Menzies Gordon, 
got up in working clothes and said, I'm Australian to my boot heels, which was really having a, a jive at Ming, who'd said, I'm British to my boot heels. But a different day, different time. But when you look at Menzies' education policy, his health policy, we might have then, in those days, had the best health scheme that we've ever had. I'm not sure about that, but it was certainly one that was designed to cover everyone in the community and at a reasonable cost. Uh, but his education policy, there'd be hundreds of thousands of people who've gone through universities who wouldn't have if Menzies hadn't turned the Commonwealth into the biggest funder of universities. In more recent years, governments have been trying to pull money back. This university used to be, what, 70% funded by the Commonwealth. It's now, what, 23 4% funded by the Commonwealth. You know, a liberal will want to invest in the future of the country, and the best investment is in the future of young Australians, because they're the people who will make this country in future years. And to compete, they need the best education available. Not the best education available in Australia, but an education that's as good as any available anywhere in the world. But governments provide less and less money. You know, one of the most illiberal acts was undertaken by a Labour Minister for Education, Dawkins. He wanted to get his sticky fingers on higher education policy. He wanted to tell academics and researchers what to do. So he abolishes the University's Commission. Now, the, the Liberal Party very much regret it, supported this legislation because they also wanted to get their sticky fingers into higher education policy. I think any federal government's policy in relation to universities has been extraordinarily reaction, reactionary and conservative. And I think it is an enormous presumption for somebody who's a politician, who happens to become a minister, to think that they really know about higher education policy. It would be like um, making a corporal minister for the army and then giving that corporal total power to say what the army will do and what it won't do and to determine training methods and techniques. Now, that's obviously ludicrous, stupid. But anyway, that's where we've gone. Unfortunately, uh, you know, to me, Menzies was a real liberal in so many elements of policy. So, you know, you've got to remember that you're going back 60 years, pretty much. Now, the first election that you contested for Wannan was the Petrov election, wasn't it? Mm. Mm. What do you remember? Uh, uh, well, perhaps you can take us back to those times, because certainly in your pre-selection speech and your speeches during the election, your radio addresses to the people of Wannan, you saw communism as the big threat, didn't you, to individual freedom, to liberal values? Yes, I did. And I think in those days it was. Again, it is, I think, extraordinarily difficult um, to take somebody who's not been part of that history and go back into an earlier time. My, uh, just to show that my father was in the unhappy generation to be in France for four and a half years in the First War and in uniform for five years in the Second. Uh, and the wars were 20 years apart. Now, the Second I knew about quite intimately because I was old enough to read papers and I'd I knew he was too old to go overseas, which he greatly uh, annoyed him uh, in the Second War, but he posted all around Australia and whatever. So you're aware of what's happening and the disruption to everyone's life and, and, and the dangers. But the First War um, was just history. Something happened out of your time. Uh, so you weren't so conscious of it. You weren't aware of the deprivations, the hardships, the tragedy, the slaughter. And so now when people are going back to the, the 50s, for most Australians, that's out of their personal memory span. And I'm, uh, you know, so it's difficult, I think, to understand the circumstances. But the Soviet Union was regarded as an outward-looking, thrusting, aggressive force. Um, Soviet leaders regularly made speeches saying they had to bury all democracies because their systems would only be secure when democracy was dead. And America was the biggest democracy, so America had to be destroyed. If America was going to be destroyed, obviously we would. Um, that didn't stop the Americans, who knew they weren't going to be destroyed, sitting down and talking about how to make the world safer the next week with Russian leaders. 
which is a message for Bush and a few other people. Uh, but in 1948, Soviet tanks marched into uh, Czechoslovakia. In 1956, into Hungary. In 1968, again into Czechoslovakia. The, you had the Iron Curtain across Europe. Uh, you had communist tempted coups in places like Greece in the early 1960s in Indonesia. The independence of Malaya was delayed 10 years while very large Malayan forces and police, supported by the British, Australia, New Zealanders, uh, fought off a communist insurrection in Malaya. So it was all relatively close and very, very real. Um, and I know there were people who felt, thought that there would be an attempted communist coup in Australia itself. Um, a lot of the Union members used to have regular trips to Moscow. They were well fated there. Many of the unions were communist. Um, again, it will be outside most of your memories, but during the war, troops had to load ships for supplies to our troops in the Middle East because in the early part of the war, it was an imperial aggressive war and the communist dead waterfront in Sydney would not load the ships. Uh, so Chifley or Curtin, to their credit, put troops in to do that job. As soon as Russia was attacked by Germany, it became an honourable people's war, and of course the war... For... So that, that was just an example of the sort of problem that was extraordinarily real in those days. Um, and there were a lot of people who felt that you know, socialism is something where governments would own everything and people would own nothing. Um, and that the only real difference between socialism and communism was that the socialists wanted to do it by democratic means, very devoutly, um, while communists were totally prepared to do it by the most violent means. But the end result was regarded as similar. And this was the frame through which you saw the Vietnam War, wasn't it? It was the frame through which I saw the Vietnam War. Um, now, uh, from hindsight, and totally from hindsight, um, I believe that Vietnam was very much a, a part of a, a national movement fighting for independence, um, and probably more that than an expression of the expansion of Soviet communism. Although it's worth noting that most of the weapons to the Viet Cong came from Russia and not from China. At the time, uh, earlier on, we thought it was mostly Chinese weapons, but that wasn't so, it was Russian. So your understanding of communism, I think it's fair to say, has changed over time? Well, uh, what's communist? Um, what socialist left? Uh, the socialist left believed in nationalisation, socialisation and all that. Uh, they did not believe in privatisation. They did not believe in capitalism. Well, now the socialist left support all of those things. So they've changed very considerably. Um, China is still called communist and in deprecating terms by a lot of the media. Um, but China is so far from Soviet communism as, as practiced by Stalin, uh, you know, two totally different things. And um, there is a, a level of freedom in China which would surprise most people. Uh, it's not a democracy. And as we understand democracy, obviously. But one thing you need to know about China is that any government, whether it happened to be democratic or communist or socialist or fascist in China, would want to keep a very strong central government. Because whenever China has had a weak central government from Beijing, China has disintegrated into warring provinces with many people dying of starvation, with many tens, hundreds, millions, I suppose, being killed in the conflicts. So maintaining the integrity of China as a whole, which does mean a strong central government for them, uh, is going to be paramount in the minds of Chinese involved with politics or government. Um, it's a remarkably different country from the time... When I first went to China, everyone was in grey Mao uniforms about 1976. The next time I went there, they were all in, uh, in suits and coloured clothes and dressed uh, as you're dressed. 
No, probably they all had coats and ties on, very neatly done. Um, but um, it, it was beginning to be a much more open and relaxed society. And that movement has gone on. There's been a lot of, I think there's paranoia in this country about China. When they increase their defense vote, China's rearming, why, why not? Well, their nuclear missiles, they have about the same number as Britain, maybe 50 more than Israel. Does that make you think? Maybe 100 more than Israel, where the Americans and the Russians have um, 23 or 4,000 each, but now they're going to cut that, and that's a very good thing. Um, we, we, we're not good at understanding China, where it comes from, how it looks at the world. We apply our standards of judgment to China, which I think is a grave and serious mistake because we're not really quite as virtuous as we sometimes believe we are. We have our own problems, our own difficulties. Well, the Rudd, the Rudd government, um, of course, would claim to understand China. There was that famous moment when Kevin Rudd spoke in Chinese. Um, do they? Well, Does he? Uh, I, no, I don't think so. Uh, the press then started to say we were too close to China. Now, that could be moved uh, into a, a, a political minus. So we've seen a defense white paper which names China as a potential problem, which I think, you know, to me it was the most regressive and stupid defense white paper that I'd seen in 40 years. Um, well, the, the worst one I'd ever seen, I suppose. And then um, uh, the government has made a number of statements about this recent court case in China, for example. Um, and we're told that China has, by the government, a legal standard like no other, as though it's the worst in the world. Well, it, it's probably not worse than a lot of other countries in the world. And a lot has been made about the alleged secrecy of some parts of the trial. But judges in Australia can order a part of a trial to be held in secret, with the press kicked out. On a different level, uh, family law reporting is minimal because names can't be used and that tends to make people very uninterested in what's happening. Um, and if national security is involved in an Australian court case, I'm sure a government would either argue that the evidence should not be given or that evidence should be undertaken in private with the press and the public kicked out. On your definition of communism and socialism, was Gough Whitlam a socialist? Um, I think they're the wrong words. I'm, I'm afraid, I, I think he had aspirations for Australia. He had a sense of Australian identity. He had a sense of Australian independence. He would certainly not have just willingly wanted to go along with America, but he would have recognized the importance of the American alliance. I don't want to say it in an unkindly way, but in some respects, especially in economic matters, he was disorganized. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a very kindly way, sure. I mean, we're talking um, about the Loans Affair, aren't we? It's, uh, well, the Loans Affair, but the budgets is... too. I mean, um, one year the budget, federal budget increased by over 40% one year to the next. The next year it increased by about 22% one year to the next, real terms. And that year the economic writer said, oh, this is a responsible budget. Well, where the economic right has gone, you know, they, they would all probably have torn up the reports they wrote in those days uh, because nobody would regard a 22% increase except in time of war or total national emergency or something as in any way responsible. Um, so where this fits in, in in terms of the political lexicon, I'm not sure. Did John Kerr do the right thing, and did, did he do it in the right way? Oh, he did the right thing. He was in the very unfortunate position of being condemned, or going to be condemned, for doing the right thing, which I think he was, or being condemned for not doing the right thing, which he would have been if, he, if there had not been an election. Um, it, 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 I, I think there are many myths about 1975. As you know, I tried not to talk about it very much. 
because every, the fifth anniversary, the tenth anniversary, the fifteenth, twentieth, thirtieth, every anniversary. And if people can and develop half-year anniversaries, they'll do it again. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I just think it's been a bit chewed over. Um, but... Um, One more time. John, John, <laughs> John Kerr, uh, I know, didn't have fully open and frank discussions with Gough Whitlam because he felt he'd be sacked and a puppet would be put in his place and that Australia would be very much at risk. Well, I think he had an obligation to speak openly to the Prime Minister and point out the dangers as he saw it. Now, that, if John Kerr in his fear was right and he was sacked, that would have immediately brought Her Majesty into the brawl because the monarchists, um, who, who are certainly the more um, fundamental monarchists, and monarchists can be fundamentalists, as a lot of other people can too, uh, and um, th th they would have said the Queen should be a backstop and therefore will not accept uh, and, and not remove uh, John Kerr from the office. But ever since the appointment of Isaac Isaacs as Governor General, the monarch has accepted, I believe, that the monarch has no option but to accept the recommendation of her Australian Prime Minister. There is no option. She would have had to accept but the Queen would have been brought in to the brawl um, by monarchists who believed that she should have been. There was a lot of talk about backstops at the time. She would, would never have been, couldn't have been, and John Kerr knew this. And one thing for which he's not got credit, and he should get credit, he was determined to keep Her Majesty out of the brawl. And he did that, absolutely. I mean, the palace was kept informed, I know that, of what was happening. But never once was the palace asked for an opinion, for a view, for advice. Um, just kept informed, and it was left at that. And if, um, if Kerr had warned Whitlam, of course, Whitlam might have called the election and contested the election as Prime Minister. You would still have won. Well, he, he, he I think, had that option at the very last minute. At the very last minute. Um, but um, it wasn't, certainly wasn't something that he was able to think about and consider. Um, and there is a duty on the head of state to be plain and open with the Prime Minister of the day. And so when you came to government, I mean, what was the feeling like when you, were, when you won that first election with record majority? Well, um, it, it was a humbling experience because the task ahead of us was obviously a, a very considerable one. Because of the circumstances and the divisions, it was important to demonstrate that we governed for all Australians, and that always would have been our intention, but we probably tried a bit harder to make sure that we did that. Um, and um, the major tasks to be undertaken, of course, were economic ones, because the economy was in an absolute and holy mess. Um, and uh, th these were the days when many governments in Europe and in the United States, believed they could stend, spend their way out of trouble. Governments in trouble spend more money, that'll create activity. Well, sometimes it gets beyond that, and it just creates more inflation, more disharmony, more jobs lost. And that's the stage that it got to in Australia. It's the stage that it got to in many countries of Europe. Um, but we tried to introduce a new kind of economics and said that the only way to fix our problems is to spend less government money or for governments to spend less of your money. And uh, so the task was to restrain government expenditure. And this was before Ronald Reagan adopted the same policy, before Margaret Thatcher adopted the same policy. So Australia was then in many ways a pioneer in altering the way governments approached the kinds of economic problems caused by a significant excess of government spending. Um, and, um, but I, I never believed that, all right, the economic bottom line is the only thing that matters. Um, governments have still got to take a balanced view. Uh, you've still got to try and do what you can to, to support the arts and non-economic activities. Um, 
maybe you won't be able to do it as much or as well as you would have wanted to in better times. Um, you've also got to look at your tax system, your social welfare structures, to see that they can operate fairly. And if there's distress and um, disharmony out in the community, all the more important to reassess these policies. And, and one of the fundamental changes that we did make was to the support for families for children, which had been through the tax system, so that the bigger income you had, the more benefit you really got from the tax deduction you were allowed. And we were well aware or advised that there were some hundreds of thousands of families whose income was not big enough to get the advantage of the tax deduction that was available. So we took the money that went to everyone by way of a tax deduction and distributed that directly to mothers as a family allowance. To the women. To, to, to the women, yes, to the women. No, we didn't trust the blokes. <laughs> and uh, um, so that, you know, that, that was, I thought, a, a very, I had a horrible job getting it through cabinet. My cabinet was um, thinking it would upset a lot of traditional supporters, but in the end, we did get it through. Um, and uh, I think it was a very well-received social reform. Um, the Galbraley report on arrival services for new settlers was also another uh, area of innovative reform. Obviously, um, we haven't got time to go through the whole record of government, but um, one of the things which is still very relevant, of course, is how we treat refugees and boat people in particular. One of the things, as I said to you before, that I found most moving in all the archival work I did, it's not often you get moved when you're coming through the archives, but um, <laughs> I was on this occasion, is looking at the cabinet records of that period when the boat people were beginning to arrive in, in their hundreds and thousands, and um, all of the solutions which have since been adopted of compulsory detention and detention centres in remote areas, they were all served up to your cabinet, not once, but several times by the bureaucracy and were consistently rejected. Can you take us back to those cabinet meetings and remind us what that was like? Well, I, I believed we had a special obligation in relation to Vietnam because a lot of the people at risk were people we'd been fighting alongside and we'd given commitments to them which we and the Americans had not been able to fulfill. It has nothing to do with the justice of the war as a whole but a, a question of uh, different sorts of ethical questions, so I felt we had an ethical question, but we also had an international obligation, which was accepted when Menzies signed the Refugee Convention in 1954, another one of the liberal things which he did. And uh, so putting all that together, I thought we had no option but to take, um, in a sense, as many people as wanted to come here. Um, I think the policy was thoroughly successful. There were some people who opposed it. Gough Whitlam had originally made a decision not to take refugees from Vietnam or Indochina, but when my government overturned that very early in the peace, um, he did not oppose it. I think Bob Hawke might have tried a bit, but not very effectively, and, and anyway, um, it, was a bi a, 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 it was a bipartisan policy. And um, I think we gained a, a very large number of very good Australian citizens as a consequence. A lot of whom have a, a, a sense of thanks or a sense of obligation to Australia. Um, and uh, I know there are many people who came here in those days who feel that you know, they want to put something back into the community at large and who are doing so. You made Australia an activist and a leader in the battle against apartheid. Well, I, I believed um, the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth of Nations, was a useful organisation. Uh, it had all sorts of different countries in it. Anyone who had been part of the British Empire was a member of the Commonwealth Na of Nations. So, um, geography, colour, race, it crossed all the boundaries. And therefore, I thought it an organisation of value. If anyone could have an influence in Rhodesia, as it then was, or South Africa, the Commonwealth should have been able to. They were part of the Commonwealth. That, that was, in one sense, a start point. 
Um, the other start point, was, I suppose, was that in terms of just basic justice, I couldn't stomach a situation where a very small number of whites in South Africa wanted to keep total dominance over an overwhelming majority of uh, Africans, of black people. And Thatcher had a different view? She was, would have an emotional reaction to something. And the emotional reaction was not necessarily her real reaction or her correct reaction. When you engaged her mind and her intellect, um, three or four months before the meeting in Lusaka over uh, Rhodesia, she'd been in Australia, and she made a speech which was harking back to earlier times, but that didn't worry me because I'd had a long discussion with her that morning. And she'd recognized a couple of basic principles in relation to Rhodesia. Um, she might have been able to impose a settlement for a while in Rhodesia if she'd shifted her army out of Northern Ireland and put it into Rhodesia. But she, wasn't, she didn't want to do that, and she couldn't have done it anyway. So the question of imposing a solution was, was just ruled out. If you weren't going to try and impose a solution, you had to have a solution that the differing parties were at least prepared to accept. They mightn't all like it. Nobody will get everything they want. But what is there something which everyone can accept? And she recognized that as a principle that would have to be followed if the fighting, if the warring, if the killing was to stop. And I believe from that moment she really set about trying to, in her mind, you know, well, how can we stop the killing? How can we get a settlement? How can we achieve a result that the different parties will accept? And that's, in the end, what happened. But that was her intellect engaging the question, not the bullets and ballot boxes and rhetorical speeches. Well, of course, the result of uh, Lusaka and, and events following that was Robert Mugabe coming to power. Um, and I imagine that's something about which you have very strong mixed feelings. Could you tell us about well, that? Uh, you know, we forget that for 10 years, Zimbabwe did pretty well. He never really took the economic decisions that would have attracted enough investment to enable unemployment to be reduced significantly. Um, then his wife, who was a Ghanaian, Sally Mugabe, died. And um, from that point, policies seemed to change dramatically. In the last 10, 20 years have been a disaster, not just for Zimbabwe, but for Southern Africa, for South Africa, three million refugees. The examples of land policies, which are extraordinarily bad, divisive, destructive, uh, which makes it harder for South Africa to conduct sensible land policies and land reform. Um, the, um, at some point, maybe 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, um, Mugabe certainly would have become beyond redemption so far as argument with white faces was concerned. Even yours? Oh, certainly. But um, he might have... I, I know my friend Obazanjo, who started off as a, a, a general in charge of a coup in Nigeria, but he twice established a democracy in his own country. His second democracy still survives. Not brilliantly, but it survives, and he ended up being a civilian president in that same democracy and, and then retired. Um, he, he once or twice tried to persuade Mugabe to change his ways, and I know he had meetings in Harare and got Mbeki to join him. But every time there was a point of difference, Mbeki sided with Mugabe and not with Obazanjo. And the fact that African states themselves were the only ones that Mugabe might really have listened to, were not able to exercise an effective influence over Mugabe is entirely and absolutely the responsible for Thabo Mbeki. Now, there are a lot of theories as to why Mbeki always took that view. He just had an odd view of certain subjects. Um, I don't accept the fact that he just supported Mugabe because Mugabe was a freedom fighter. Mbeki had been the bag carrier for the ANC, not getting his hands dirty, living in London, Lagos, um, Lusaka, in the difficult apartheid years. But maybe picking um, Mbeki 
over Ramaphosa was a mistake. Um, Ramaphosa had been the head of the union leader fighting apartheid from the inside. He was the internal, running great risks personally and also for the union movement from time to time, but doing it with a sense of balance. Um, he's still a very respected figure in South Africa. Uh, but why Mabeki chose to support the madness of Mugabe, I don't know. And coming back to home and to the present day, what do you hope for for Australia and what do you fear? Oh, I hope that um, um, we will play a role in making sure, I was at a lecture last night about the cosmos, which I know absolutely nothing about, <laughs> but I'd had an earlier discussion with uh, Lloyd Rees, um, and, um, you know, for the first time, the human race in two different areas has the capacity to destroy not only the human race, but pla the planet. In all of uh, the history of, of people on, on this planet, um, humankind, humanity has not had that power before. Today we have it. Wrong decisions on climate change, and we can do it. Wrong decisions in relation to nuclear weapons, and we can do it through a nuclear contest. Um, and, um, you know, other civilizations have um, either been destroyed or destroyed themselves from internal decay. I hope Australia is going to play a constructive role in making sure that today's people on the world make the right decisions, especially about nuclear weapons, because I think that danger is probably more urgent than the other. So many people today have a, um, the knowledge how to make nuclear weapons, um, and um, uh, as the, 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 the information of how you do it is quite widely known. The capacity to do it is widely known. If a poor nation like North Korea can develop nuclear weapons and missiles, pretty well any nation in the world can. And that ought to be a sobering thought. So uh, these are real and present dangers. And I'd like to think that Australia could play a, a really constructive role in trying to help um, guide the world in, in, into saner paths. The only way to do it on this subject is to ban the bomb, ban all bombs and aim for zero nuclear weapons. Get everyone. Now, Obama has said he supports that. Um, Medvedev in Russia has said he supports that. Those two countries have acted. They've made decisions to reduce nuclear weapons by 30%. But that still leaves them both enough to destroy the universe probably 50 times over, which is a slightly sobering thought. Um, and um, we have a defense policy uh, that still rests on the benefits of the American nuclear deterrent, which I think is ludicrous when the prime minister has said he also wants to see the abolition of nuclear weapons. The defense policy needs to be brought into line. So this is just one of the areas where Australia's policy today is remarkably deficient. Um, I would like to see on quite different levels playing politics with border protection as the opposition does. The government's got a two-headed policy. You know, we're more compassionate than Howard was, and to an extent they are. But on the other, other head of their policy, they say, we're just as tough as Howard was. They can't have it both ways. Uh, and the opposition saying you've lost control of the borders is errant, absolute. It, it is bloody nonsense to suggest that four or five or six thousand people, four or five or six thousand people a year represent a threat to Australia. It doesn't, it, it's not so. Um, so, what we desperately need in this area as a government and an opposition that will develop a unified, sensible, compassionate, firm, if you like, policy, but one which they then take outside the realm of politics, which both parties support. Because uh, playing politics with this issue is playing politics with people's lives, playing politics with people very often 
fleeing the most terrible tyranny or distress. And that's about the most unseemly thing that we could do. And it's something which is noticed right around the world and which just makes people wonder, well, you know, have we really put Tampa behind us? More extreme people might say, have we really put the white Australia policy behind us? I, I almost feel like going to um, South Africa or, or Zimbabwe organize a boatload of white farmers. <laughs> I'd sail them into Perth, Fremantle Harbour. Um, the government's not going to trip them back. And that would expose the policy for what it is in one blow. Well, if you do that, Malcolm, it will have to go into the second edition of the book. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but as it is, I think we're out of time. So um, thanks very much for working with me and for talking tonight. Well. <laughs> There's, is this more powerful? There's one thing, there's one thing that um, I wanted to say, which I haven't said tonight. Uh, I've said that Margaret's done all the work and she's done all the writing and all of that. Um, but um, the book, I'm told, is readable. Uh, and that is entirely Margaret's responsibility because she's put the words together, she's made it readable. And so many contemporary histories, I think, can be, even if the subject matter has some interest in it, the words seem to deaden that interest and make it, you know, really hard work. Now, from what I've told by other people, um, Margaret has really succeeded in turning out a readable document of nearly 800 pages. And I think that's a brilliant effort, so thank you, Margaret. Ladies and gentlemen, Warren Bebbington's my name. I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University. Uh, we see as an important mission of the University providing a platform for discourse on uh, ideas and issues of public interest and significance in a neutral environment. We do quite a bit of this, uh, and in, uh, in terms of our political leaders of many different uh, stamps. We had the Prime Minister on this platform just two days ago. And I think anyone who attends these functions knows that that collection of sound bites from the media through which we are required to get to know our political leaders is totally inadequate and that this forum is, uh, this kind of forum is absolutely fabulous as an alternative and I do hope you will continue coming to these presentations. Malcolm Fraser is a man who, since leaving his Prime Ministership, has continued to surprise, and I think tonight you've had <coughs> a, a very good sample of uh, his incredible knowledge and, uh, and uh, of history, uh, of international politics, of political ideology, of current affairs. Um, you've, if you've not met him before, you'll have learned he has a sense of humour. Um, <clears throat> a few weeks ago I had the privilege uh, of being at the launch of this book where Justice Michael Kirby made a, a, a really quite moving speech about the book. Amongst the many things he said was to refer to um, uh, uh, um, a piece that's been quoted elsewhere I know where uh, uh, a reporter says to Malcolm, Malcolm, it seems you've moved to the left, and he says, I haven't moved. Everyone else has moved to the right. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, I think you might have had a glimpse of that tonight. Um, I don't have the eloquence uh, that Michael Kirby had to convey what a beautifully written and thoughtful book this is, and uh, I do hope you'll buy it, it's for sale just outside. Um, Louise Adler has been mentioned here and I'd like to um, express our thanks to Louise and Melbourne University Publishing for producing this volume and a series of so many other interesting volumes recently uh, like this. I'd like to thank the Faculty of Arts for, for their role in putting this on, but most of all I'm sure you would like to join with me in congratulating Malcolm Fraser and Margaret on producing this work and wishing them well with its success. <coughs>